But no, this successful Ollie's got to be very excited for Ed because in a few years when we're doing this show and we got to put Ed in a home, he could probably get around by <laughs> successful Ollie. He can call up Ollie. <laughs> okay, Stanley. <laughs> Welcome to IXSVO with Brian Fischler and Ed Plumacher. Making it happen with voiceover accessibility. And now, here's Brian and Ed. Welcome back to yet another episode of iAxis VO. We're playing with uh, half a man down today. How you feeling over there today, Ed? Uh, I'm coming back, Brian. I'm coming back. It's been a rough few days, but uh, you know, it's not often I get sick. But boy, when I do, it just uh, just takes me out for a couple of days. Yeah, I think you know, in the year and a half we've been doing this, this is the first time you've been sick. We know I had that uh, fun bug with my uh, Lord Vader type breathing uh, through most of December, but uh, you know, so at least uh, I'm not hearing any deep uh, breathing from you. It sounds like you're breathing okay. I only do that when I call you late at night. Oh, so that is you breathing on the other end of the phone. <laughs> I thought it was a woman. <laughs> But, uh, so, uh, Ed, did you hear about, uh, Facebook is, uh, Facebook video is now, uh, coming to the Apple TV. Brian, ask me if I care about Facebook video. <laughs> or, uh, I want to ask you if you care about the Apple TV, because we established that you don't have one. Well, I have, I have the third generation. I do not have the fourth generation. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. If Apple gets their act together with Apple TV, I probably would go out and buy one. But it, I haven't seen any reason to do that yet. But, yeah, you know, as far as Facebook video goes, I think it's, you know, it's something that a lot of people use. I know my kids use all kinds of stuff. So, you know, it's good. It's developing. Let's see how accessible it's going to be out of the box. Uh, I believe we had a we had a listener comment on that too, didn't we? Yeah, uh, Alan Hoffman, uh, a listener of ours, uh, tweeted us in, and uh, he actually wrote what I was thinking. He put it in better words, though, saying, "I wonder if it'll be accessible day one." And because Facebook, you know, whenever they launch a new app, it's like they've never heard of accessibility. Well, it's not, not that I've never heard of it, but they treat it like an afterthought. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But, you know, it's interesting, though, because I remember I was so excited when Twitter was coming to the Apple TV. And since that first day when it was it worked so poorly with voiceover, I haven't even bothered to go back to check out Twitter works with voiceover on the Apple TV. And that's the problem with these things. You know, we find something that works. We love it. We work with it. Accessibility breaks. You check it once, maybe twice, and if it's not there, you move on because there's so many other applications coming out, you know, every every week, every month, and uh, you know, sometimes there's always something better on the horizon. You know, it's funny because I realize I don't even watch Facebook video on the iPhone because I can't see the video. And have you ever watched anybody Facebook Live? I just don't get it. No, but there is something coming out with the the Facebook Live is going just audio now, and and I see a lot more people doing that, and I see I see a lot more people in the blind community doing that. So that I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, now you know you know what I just realized is probably next. Facebook will launch a Facebook Live app, which of course will be completely inaccessible because they just don't have a good track record with launching uh, new apps and. Uh, working well with voiceover and everything. But one thing I was excited to see work uh, with voiceover is this new thing called Reverb, uh, which allows you to put the Amazon A-L-E-X-X-A on the iPhone as well as the Mac, and it's completely accessible. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's pretty cool. I mean, you know, you would ask me if I had installed it after after we reviewed it, and you, and you told me a, a lot about it, and I was like, no, and you're like, well, why not? I'm like, oh, how many personal assistants can I have on my iPhone? I just thought it was pretty cool. I mean, the fact that everything worked great with VoiceOver, and you know, this is for those of you who have not dove into the Echo community. And you want to kind of check to see what it's all about. This is for free. Uh, it's called Reverb. You can download it, as I mentioned, to your iOS device or your Mac computer. And, uh, you know, 
I think uh, you'll enjoy it and everything. And you could ask it. I th- it. It works with everything except playing music. Uh, you link it up to your Amazon account. You can order things directly through it. And uh, it worked great with some of my skills. I checked it out. And, uh, you know, it was just a two-finger tap and hold. And it, you, you don't even have to say that magic word, which, you know, I'm using it in the same room where my Echo device is. So I didn't want to have multiple devices going off. So you don't have to say the same word because you are holding down a button to speak to it directly. Right. Let me ask you a question. So you you installed it on your iPhone. Did you use it on the Mac as well? Did you install it on your Mac? You did? Oh, yeah. Okay. And you get it from the Mac App Store, and, uh, you know, it'll set it up. uh, Once you download it, it sets it up uh, in your uh, applications folder, and uh, just uh, use the VO and the space button, and it basically was listening, and I told, asked it uh, the weather, worked great, and then I asked... uh, uh, with one of my skills and everything, and it worked fantastic. So it's it's just nice to see that this works right away with voiceover, which I was impressed about. I can't believe we're already like halfway through February, which means that we are just about six months away from September. You know what happens in September, don't you, Brian? Uh, not really, but I know what happens this time of February. Apple rumors. Yeah, Apple rumors start because in September, the new iPhones always seem to come out. So uh, there's a lot of rumors going around about this. So what do you think or what are you looking for in a new iPhone 8? You know, one of the things that I'm hearing, which is a big disappointment disappointment to me, is that Touch ID may be going away. I mean, this, I really like Touch ID. I mean, I think it's fantastic. And it's, it's I, I, you know, there's rumors that it might be going away and, 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 in favor of some facial recognition or some eye scan. Yeah, we were joking earlier that, yeah, it'll probably be a retina scan, That, but the fact that we have RP, our retinas don't work properly. So, <laughs> Not that they don't work properly, but they're constantly changing because of the degradation. Yeah. You know, you know and well, then... Uh, can't unlock I used to my have, iPhone today. <laughs> right. I, you know, I used to have cataracts, so I'm sure that would have impacted that too. So it's like, you know, don't take away my touch ID. I, I love it. Yeah, you know, and then there, there's talk that the home button's going to be going away in favor of uh, some kind of uh, on-screen thing, you know. And these are just all rumors. I mean, we're early into it, but hey, we are a technology show, so we do have to talk about some of these uh, rumors that we're hearing. And, uh, you know, I don't really know what I want to see. I mean, I do like the whole facial recognition thing. I mean, it just be you hold your phone up and boom, it opens. And but I, I've really enjoyed finger, I you know the fingerprint idea. I mean, I think it's worked pretty good. I've never really had any serious issues with it. Is there anything you're looking for in particular from uh, an iPhone eight, maybe? No, not particularly. I mean, you know, I'm I'm satisfied with what I have going on now. I'm not into the dual camera system because I'm not big into photography or the video portion of things. But uh, you know. I think that you have the iPhone 7, you have the new style of home button, which is not really a button anymore, it's some kind of taptic rec- recognition system, uh, and that seems to work well. Yeah, and you know, one of the things though I that I know you, I, I haven't asked you recently, uh, you do have a wireless charging case, so wireless charging is something that does interest me. I mean, just to throw my phone down and not have to connect it, just if I had a pad or something, I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, and, and I'm hearing that that's coming. I, I'm hearing that wireless charging is going to be part of the uh, the iPhone 8. Uh, the other thing I'm hearing at is the high-end phone is going to be a thousand dollars. Well, I guess that's why I've never gotten the Plus phone, Ed, because that's just ridiculous. A thousand dollar price. What what are they going to pack into that? I mean, does it drive you anywhere? No, 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 it doesn't. But uh, you know, Brian, the iPhone. Seven now. If you get if you get the the iPhone, the large, you know, I guess the largest iPhone seven with all the bells and whistles and the largest uh, the largest RAM. Uh, I think you're paying nine hundred and eighty dollars. You see, this is why I've always gone with the Reese's peanut butter cups regular style, just so I never got sucked into that king size and everything and the the extra costs to everything supersize me right supersize you know <laughs> and, although i i am a big fan of supersized fries and that 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 coke that's illegal in new york because under bloomberg because it was too big to fit his parameters and everything <laughs> but you know one thing that i would like to see and i guess this really is not an I- iPhone 8, but uh, I guess it would be the operating system, which who knows, I guess they'll call it iOS 11. I just like Siri to work like it used to and understand me more. 
I don't know. Just the way you just said that, I, I just had all these other thoughts pop in my I, I'm head. I'm just like, getting the like, one sec and hold on. And I, I, are we I'm, talking about your phone? Are we talking about your, your ex-girlfriend or something here? What, what is this? <laughs> I just want to be loved, Ed. I just want to be hugged and held. <laughs> what do you mean? Siri can't do that? <laughs> uh, no, Brian. But uh, you know what? We have a lot of fans out there. I'm sure somebody loves you, Brian. Yeah, well, let me know. You know, uh, 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 blind podcasters need love, too. You can tweet us in at iAccessVO or email us in at iAccessVO at gmail.com. Now, Ed, I think Apple's been swinging and missing a lot lately. What about you? Yeah, you know, I think in terms of you know where they're going what's happening you know it seems like their their main focus is really moved back to the iPhone itself i mean you know knowing how steve jobs is this guy must be spinning uh seeing all the different models and different sizes and things going on but you know what it's their bread and butter brian it's where they're making their money so um you know ipad sales are down again for what the third or fourth year in a row um you know max macbook sales and mac sales are are okay they're increasing but you know nothing phenomenal and uh you know everything everything's about the phone yeah you know i'm, I'm talking more about things about the phone the podcast app swing and a miss Siri gone downhill. Apple Pencil. What are you kidding me? I've got 10 pencils on my hand. The TV app, major swing and a miss. I, I mean, everything that they seem to be coming out with, uh, it just they, they just seem to be missing on everything. You know, Remember when Apple would take something like an app and do it better than everybody else? Those days are gone. Yeah, the one thing I do see on you didn't just mention it, but it's on your show notes here. You mentioned Apple Pay. Apple Pay actually just passed uh, PayPal as the number one uh, source for uh, for paying uh, online. I've still paying yet to use it. Wireless. <laughs> yet to use it, you know. And, uh, I, I've set it up, and I don't think I've used it yet either. Nope. But it, it's ready to go. I've used PayPal because when uh, I students pay me, they pay me through PayPal sometimes. I've yet to use Apple Pay. I, I don't find I find it more of a nuisance than anything. Sometimes when you get that that home screen that comes up and it's like, oh, you would use your Apple Pay, and I'm like, I'm just trying to unlock my phone. I don't know why it's asking me about Apple Pay. I'm not trying to pay for anything, but it, it just seems like gone is the day when when Apple would come out with an app that would make some other app, you know, defunct and everything. It really seems like uh, app developers are doing a better job than Apple is of creating uh, useful solutions. Well, it's not even just uh, apps. It's just the innovation. And, you know, the, 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 I, I have to say, I think the Apple TV is one of the biggest disappointments uh, in the past two or three years I've seen with them. I, I've expected a lot more. This all seemed to start with the Maps fiasco. It's just been growing since then, you know. It's like they come out with something and it's... Uh, I'm not sure where they're going. I mean, we heard so much about autonomous cars. They supposedly had an entire division working on that, and then they let everybody go. So, you know, I'm not sure what the direction is or where they're going. Phone sales have been great. I mean, but I think a lot of that had to do with the uh, the exploding Samsungs uh, last fall. So, you know, let's see what happens in 2017. They've got their 10-year anniversary coming up. Maybe they're going to... Maybe they'll come out with that product that everybody can't live without. I don't know. One thing that um, that I've never understood really, and, and maybe it's just this two-step authentication. I mean, maybe it's because I've been very fortunate and I've never had, you know, any of my IDs, you know, or, or none of my passwords have been stolen or anything. But I don't get it. I don't understand why more of these apps aren't making, instead of two-step authentication, why they're not just making use of the fingerprint ID. That's simple and easy. Yeah, you know what? I, I do use two-step authentication with a lot of the stuff that I do on the computer. You know, uh, you know, you have the ability to do that even with uh, Google and things like that. But uh, on the iPhone itself, you're right. Why can't we just use our fingerprint as the second step of you know authenticating and identifying who we really are? Um, I have that with Chase Manhattan Bank. Why I don't have it with other products, I'm not sure. I have it with Citibank as well as Amazon, and 
never had any problems, you know, with Amazon. And and Apple Pay works off it as well. So, you know, what's the point? Yeah. You know, I, I, instead of uh, me having to remember more logins, uh, it's just nice to put my finger on things. And, you know, one of the things that drives me bonkers is, I, you know, obviously I'm a huge fan of the Yahoo Fantasy app. I can't, and I only use that app for fantasy, so I'm not exactly concerned about somebody stealing my Yahoo password. I keep getting asked to change my password in Yahoo because it's not secure. And uh, also, they then want my my phone number, which I don't know why. But if you can't protect my password, why do I want to give you my phone number? <laughs> You know what? I think the other thing that drives me really crazy with this, too, is I do not understand why if my phone restarts or I restart my phone, why do I have to punch in my, you know, my, my PIN number? Why can't I just continue to use my, you know, the, the, the fingerprint ID? I think it's probably in case somebody cut your fingers off and took them. That way, you know, you have to enter the number and everything. They can't just use your fingers to get into your phone. You know what, Brian? If someone cut my fingers off and took them, I have bigger problems than worrying about my iPhone. (laughs) Uh, Not me, my friend. I'm always worried about my iPhone. I'm surprised I don't have nightmares about my iPhone, but maybe I do. I just can't remember any of my nightmares. But uh, no, yeah, yeah, you definitely have bigger problems then. But yeah, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense to me that uh, more, more, more authentication when we have a simple way of doing it and everything. Well, I think this is a this is a deeper problem with Yahoo, though. I think Yahoo is, you know, I, I gave up on Yahoo many, many years ago because of the constant issues that they were having with uh, with passwords and, and with people hacking into Yahoo email accounts. And I, you know, I guess that they were the prime target at one time for uh, for going after people with mail and a lot of phishing went on. And, you know, once your friend clicks on something, they have your mail and you, you get something from a friend and it seemed to spread and spread a lot. And and, uh, you know, I know people in my family, you know, my kids, my wife, some of them still use Yahoo and they're constantly getting emails to to change their passwords. And I said, I keep telling them, go Gmail. We got a guy that uh, I think he's going to tell us some pretty interesting things that he's doing with technology. A pretty uh, exciting guest we have here this weekend. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's uh, a fellow RPer, uh, Eric Manser. Um, he uh, he actually works for IBM and has uh, really, really built himself a nice career in technology. So uh, why don't we go visit Eric, uh, who's also, I believe, uh, one of the early beta testers and uh, a user of Ira, which is a company we did a, a feature on, uh, I believe, at the end of last summer. So in the show notes, I'll make sure to link up that, that previous episode as well so people can revisit that if they want to as well well but let's go talk to eric now we'd like to welcome in a very special guest a man who runs more than forrest gump and a man who more importantly works in accessibility at ibm eric manzer how you doing today eric hey guys doing really well thank you for having hey welcome welcome to iaccessvo eric nice to have you on it's a pleasure what does somebody who works in accessibility at IBM do, Eric? Well, no two days are the same. I'll tell you that much. It's uh, <laughs> it's very interesting and, and certainly rewarding work. Um, you know, I do a lot of, you know, sort of user testing. I mean, the team that I'm on at IBM, our, our number one responsibility is, you know, trying to work to uh, ensure that you know, IBM as a company, whatever we're developing uh, is being done in an accessible way. Uh, and so, you know, we have uh, very much uh, kind of interest and responsibility for uh, making sure that the teams across IBM uh, are aware of, uh, you know, kind of the standards that exist for, for doing things in an accessible way and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll be doing user testing uh, or, you know, holding kind of informational uh, sessions with various development teams and things like that, uh, just to raise the awareness within the organization itself. Uh, but then there's, you know, other times where you're doing a kind of external facing activities. Uh, and some of the projects I'm involved with now are, uh, are more towards that. So, uh, you know, it's really interesting and exciting stuff to be a part of. Good. You know, you know, uh, Eric, uh, before we started, uh, we had a little dialogue, and you were explaining to us that IBM had a rich history of, A, being being a longtime tech company, and B, actually hiring their first accessible, uh, their first blind person over 100 years ago. Yeah, that's sure? absolutely true. I mean, I'm, you know, one of the things I'm most 
proud about about being an IBMer. I mean, we're unique in the fact that you know we're a tech company that's over 100 years old. Uh, but as an IBMer who happens to have a disability myself, I mean, I, I find it extremely, you know, a, a, an extreme source of pride uh, that you know this company has been paying attention to the, these sorts of things and these matters for you know for as long as the company has been in existence. And you know, to your point, I mean, you know, we did hire our first blind engineer in 1914. Uh, IBM was very, very, you know, active and involved in, in developing the early screen reader technology. And, you know, just a, when I came to IBM just a little over two years ago, you know, it was such a humbling experience to, to be surrounded by, you know, such a, a broad team uh, of accessibility engineers uh, from all geographies. I mean, our, our team is spread all over the world. So uh, it's really, you know, an exciting team to be a part of and, and such a talented group. And, uh, you know, to know that, uh, you know, they're paying attention to the sorts of things that matters, uh, you know, that matter to everyone, really, uh, the ability to access technology. So it's uh, it's great to be a part of it. Now, the average Joe on the street might not realize that uh, IBM doesn't really make computers anymore. So is your work really involved with enterprise solutions? Yeah, I mean, we're unique again in that, um, you know, we're not really doing much on the in the consumer space uh, or haven't really been doing much in the consumer space. Uh, so most of our, uh, you know, development, you know, t developing technologies have to do with the enterprise space, uh, a lot of business to business, uh, you know, interaction. Uh, and so, you know, the um, the thing that's interesting about that is. You know, oftentimes, I mean, historically, and I think both of you are probably aware of this, you know, with matters of accessibility, largely uh, the main consideration has been kind of driven at, at the federal, you know, whether it was government procurement or things like that. Uh, but we're seeing a little bit of a shift where, you know, now business leaders are really recognizing the importance of accessibility to the bottom line in business. Uh, and so we're being engaged at a high, at a much higher level. Uh, just to, you know, because it's a, accessibility, the ability or not to access, you know, access these solutions uh, can, you know, have a, a significant impact to the bottom line of any business. So, uh, you know, it's really a conversation that has shifted in recent years and uh, continues to, to kind of evolve. And, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, when we're doing business or have been doing business primarily with other businesses, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting to notice that, uh, you know, now some of the biggest <laughs> business leaders are, are taking notice, you know? Yeah, the the last job that I, the last real job that I worked, which was 2009, I, I we had an enterprise system and, uh, you know, I use ZoomText uh, uh, daily and I, I can't imagine that their systems would have been fully accessible, which they now may be. But a lot of people would be kind of shocked to learn, though, that uh, even though you work at IBM, uh you use a Mac while working at IBM. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, for years, I mean, prior to coming to IBM, you know, uh, I worked, uh, I can't recall, did we mention the company name? Like I, I worked at a different large tech company uh, prior to joining IBM. And so for a long time, I mean, until very recently, I was strictly a Windows PC guy. And, you know, so I was very familiar with things like magic and Zoom text and, and you know getting by with the magnification and and kind of the features that they offered and um you know and when i joined ibm uh, it was right around the time that ibm had announced a partnership uh, between apple and ibm uh and working together we've developed kind of a, a catalog of enterprise grade mobile apps uh specifically geared towards you know towards the enterprise uh and you know, because IBM, you know, doesn't, you know, we some years ago spun off kind of the PC business and uh, that, you know, went on to become Lenovo. Um, you know, so we with that IBM Apple partnership, uh, it kind of opened up the options for us to actually use Apple devices as IBM employees, which was very exciting. And so, again, being someone who had never used uh, an Apple like a, a Mac PC, uh, like a Mac computer or uh, like a MacBook laptop, um, you know, two, two months ago, I actually started and got my first MacBook Pro uh, and have been playing around with a lot of the, like specifically the low vision features, the ability to invert the colors and things that I was familiar with. 
Uh, and it's been a it's been a really wonderful experience. It's been a learning experience for sure, but it, it, it's been a you know overall very positive experience. I mean, I I did have familiarity, you know, to Apple's credit and giving credit where credit is due. I mean, you know, I carry an iPhone and I have for years. Uh, you know, I, I love the things that they've done in terms of making the uh, the accessibility features seamless and integrated, and you know, just part of the design. And, and that's a testament to considering accessibility from the earliest stages of, of design. So, um, you know, I was familiar with that, but yeah, I mean, the uh, the learning curve with the MacBook is how been, steep uh, was that learning curve coming from the PC side? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was a little. Um, you know, but I, it only takes you know two or three days, and, and you're right hip to it. You know, I mean, uh, you know, it was really a matter. I mean, a lot of the, the shortcut keys on the keyboard, uh, you know, it was simply a matter of just learning some of the, the subtle differences, or even you know something you know still where I you know have some remaining vision and I get by using a mouse still uh, at this point, like you know just trying to close a window, right? I mean. For years, I, I would go to the upper right corner of, a, of whatever window I was in and, and kind of click on the X to, to shut it down. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the opposite side of the screen. Just familiarizing with these, you know, subtle design differences. Uh, and, you know, once once you're kind of aware of them, it's uh, it becomes very, very easy and seamless, you know, so. So when you, when you have to work on something that, say, is in the Windows environment, are you set up where you use, like, VMware Fusion to be able to just switch over quickly, or do you, do you use different hardware? How does that work? Um, well, to be honest, I, I haven't, um, since moving to the Mac, I haven't done any testing specific on Windows yet, um, but I do have the Lenovo laptop that I, uh, that, you know, I retired when I kind of adopted the Mac. Uh, so the, sh- the near term plan would be to, you know, to just boot that up again and, and uh, you know, do any testing, you know, specific to Windows that I need to do on that uh, because I still have access to it. But, yeah, I, I think, you know, what you're describing, Ed, you know, uh, is probably a, an efficient, uh, op- you know, possibility or option to consider uh, moving forward rather than, you know, hanging on to two different laptops, uh, you know, that. that that possibility would make sense. So, especially especially when you have to travel. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> What's well, great to hear because it's rare that Ed and I get to hear that uh, somebody in corporate America is using a Mac. Most of the time, we hear, "Ah, oh, well, at work, I have to use a PC because the things that I have to do at the office are not accessible on the Mac." So it's nice to to hear that a forward thinking company like IBM is is making those things accessible on the Mac side. Yeah, again, I mean, I can't say enough good things about my experience so far at IBM. I mean, it's, you know, wonderfully, I mean, I hate to use the term accommodating, but I mean, you know, it it, it has really been, um, you know, just an incredibly welcoming experience, you know, since since joining and, um, you know, the fact that you can kind of choose the, the device that, that is going to best meet your, your particular preferences or needs, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it just has, uh, has made things so much easier from a, uh, from a usability standpoint. So that's remarkable. Now, um, something that Ed and I have talked about on this program, uh, is IRA and you are part of the IRA Explorer program. And uh, so Ed and I are very excited. What has that been like for you? What's what's Ira been like for you? Yeah, it was really interesting. About a year ago, or maybe just under a year ago, I uh, had the opportunity to meet Suman, uh, who's the CEO of Ira, and he and I were both on a uh, technology panel here in, in Boston, and you know, we got to talking and he was telling me about this, this technology that his company developed and, you know, a young company, a a startup certainly. And, uh, he was describing it to me and asking, you know, my, you know, if I could, could imagine any value in, in, you know, the, the use. And I was, I was intrigued, uh, for sure. Uh, so, you know, that was one discussion we had. And then, uh, last year at the uh, NFB convention, actually in Orlando, last July, I, I had the opportunity in the uh, in the exhibit hall to actually try it out. Uh, you know, because I have some vision remaining. Uh, you know, I think that you know many of the people who were demoing the technology in that exhibit hall were basically walking around the exhibit hall, and, and you know, the Ira agent. If if people are familiar, I mean, Ira is. 
uh, a solution where you can wear, you know, Google Glass that has a camera mounted on it. Uh, and there's a, a person, a sighted, you know, assistant that's located somewhere else who's actually accessing that camera and helping you, you know, navigate and identify things. So it's really, really pretty innovative. Uh, and, you know, in that demo setting, most of the people were kind of walk, or most of the people that I was aware of were walking around the exhibit hall and being told what exhibitors were there and what sorts of project products they were offering. Uh, with my state of low vision, I mean, you know, to an, to an extent, I'm still able to identify a lot of that, that type of thing on my own. So uh, in my demo, I actually uh, took the, the glass and, I, you know, Suman said it was cool to do this. So I took the glass outside of the exhibit hall uh, into the main hallway, right? Like in any convention or conference, like, you know, one of the most challenging navigational points for me is that hallway where people are just crisscrossing and you know traffic and everyone's walking all different directions so i you know was i had a couple of things i needed to personally accomplish like i needed to identify in this conference center or convention center it was also like a hotel that had restaurants and things like that i needed to figure out a restaurant uh to meet a friend for lunch and uh, be able to identify the path from the, the exhibit hall to that restaurant. So anyway, I, I had, you know, I remember it was Aaron on the uh, on the line with me helping guide. And I so I left the exhibit hall and, you know, kind of navigated with Aaron's assistance from the exhibit hall down to, uh, you know, kind of a Tex-Mex restaurant that was not too far away, uh, which I could easily, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, recreate that path later on when I had to go meet my friend for dinner and I now I had a restaurant to suggest so it was really a really compelling and, and good experience so it was something else uh, well once you got involved in the program you know I, I follow you on Facebook you know we're Facebook friends and I, I saw recently how you were traveling and I believe you know having the system now you were using it in the airport as part of your travel experience is that true <laughs> That's absolutely true. I've, uh, you know, actually, as of late August or early September last year, I became, you know, one of their beta testers. So I've, you know, I had the kind of early view um, ability to kind of start testing some things out with it uh, over the fall. Uh, and they actually just recently launched uh, in January to actual customers. So, you know, I, I got a, a little bit of a, a, a sneak peek. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I use it uh, at airports. I find that, you know, as, you know, we're getting or we're seeing more feedback from more and more users, that seems to be a very common uh, scenario where people are getting great value from it, right? Like the uh, the airport situation where you need to find your gate and, and you know, get through security and, and make sure you don't miss your flight type of thing. So, you know, that seems like a, a common um you know, benefit of the solution itself. Let me itself. stop you right there. What was going through security like with your phone up and Ira glasses on? Did that freak them out? Um, to be honest with you, I I have been using Ira after I get security uh, or get through security, I should say. Um, yeah, I haven't. I, I would guess, you know, you're exactly right. I mean, that, that seems like, you know, it would raise some, uh, some eyebrow <laughs> in security. Um, but, you know, one huge thing that I've noticed about my IRA experience is that it's still very subject to personal preferences, right? Like, you know, each user is going to have their own scenarios that, that, you know, they're really inclined to use it more or less. Or uh, So, you know, the fact that as a solution, IRA allows the user to really decide for themselves when they get the best benefit out of it, right? Like in my traveling experience, like just from a personal standpoint, you know, one of the nicest things that I experience in, a, in, a, in you know, my day to day is the kindness of strangers in the airport setting. Like people go out of their way uh, to offer assistance, you know, to offer an elbow or a shoulder to, to help you navigate and walk. So, you know, I haven't been using the Iris solution uh, but I, you know, if in a pinch, and I'll, I'll say that Jessica at Ira has pulled me out of a few binds a couple of times already. But, you know, it, the airport for me hasn't proven to be one of the, the high use areas uh, in, in my particular use of the solution. But, you know, once I get to my hotel room, then 
I mean, Ira, it's like having on the spot orientation. Like, you know, you can pretty much rely on the fact that most hotel rooms have a lot of the same features. They have, you know, the TV with the remote control that's somewhere in that area where the TV is. They have, you know, the lighting, uh, you know, is, is different in different hotel rooms, the thermostat, things like that, like the mini fridge, all this kind of thing. So by the time I get to my hotel room, I absolutely pull out, you know, the Ira Glass or even just the app on the phone and, you know, I, I dial them up and ask if they can help me. You had started uh, months ago, as you had mentioned, using Ira, and at the time you had been using it uh, with just holding up your iPhone. And I believe you recently, a few months ago, got the glasses. How has the experience differed with the glass compared to just using the iPhone? It's lovely in that it's hands free, right? It's it's excellent in, you know, um, it, it's great to have that hands free capability. But I will say, and I've shared this with Suman and, and uh, Troy also, it's, you know, at Ira, um, Troy's the CEO, it's the COO of Ira. Um, you know, I told them candidly that, you know, my preference still is, you know, just having the, uh, the app on the phone with my Bluetooth headset. Uh, and just just for the sake of agility and, you know, um, when I need like when I decide to use the glass, like there's a MiFi, there's a, a personal Wi-Fi device, uh, an AT&T device that comes with the solution that uh, you, you basically just need to have on your person uh, when using the glass. And then you also need to have your smartphone. And so what is the MiFi? That's another device that you have to carry with you. Yeah, it's slightly smaller than a uh, than a cell phone or than than my iPhone. Like it's you know it's about the same width, but about half the height of my iPhone. And and I have an iPhone six. And so you know it's just the uh, AT and T MiFi device that uh, that allows you kind of a ubiquitous connectivity, right? So I as long as I have it in my pocket or in my bag uh, when I'm using. The, the Google Glass, then I, I'm able to stay connected pretty reliably. Um, you know, the thing for me as a user, uh, you know, when I decide I'm in a situation where I could, you know, really use some assistance, uh, at that point to kind of pause and, and you know, bring the MiFi device out and, and bring the glasses out and, you know, the, I carry them in a case because, it, you know, it's kind of a hard, ruggedized case that, that keeps them safe and that kind of thing. Um, it, you know, in my experience, in my personal, again, opinion, uh, I just have an easier time just throwing on the, the headphones that I'm most often anyway, I'm already using, right? I'm either listening to a podcast, you know, I'm listening to you guys or I'm talking on the phone or whatever. So I've got the headset on. And so all I have to do is grab my phone and, and you know, trigger the app. So, you know, in my, again, experience, you know, just to keep moving forward, I, you know, I, I have better luck just using the, the app. But again, you know, the drawback there is that's not hands-free. You know, I do have to hold the, the camera of the phone up in front of me and where I use a white cane, both hands are occupied, you know? So uh, as long as I'm in a situation where I can, you know, have one phone or, or one hand holding the phone and one hand holding the cane, uh, then, you know, then that's a, an effective solution for me, so. Well, I know that you said you're going to be at CSUN next week. This show is going to be coming out on Friday. So if any of our listeners are actually going to be at CSUN in San Diego next week, I guess they could actually uh, meet you and see Ira in uh, in San Diego. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. I've, we've got a couple of sessions, actually, that we'll be uh, talking about the, uh, you know, the Ira solution. Uh, I candidly with you, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get them to uh, take a, a look at uh, incorporating some of the Watson technology uh, that IBM has been developing, whether it's, you know, the uh, computer vision uh, API that, that Watson includes or, you know, because I, I, you know, love the agents that I've dealt with, like the, the human contact. And, you know, there's great value to the, uh, the guidance that you get from the IRA agents. They're all very skilled. They're all very friendly and, and it's been a great experience. But, you know, some of the potential, I think that the could be uh, with this solution are things like facial recognition, uh, you know, the ability to kind of uh, identify, you know, in real time, uh, the, the, the path ahead, if that makes sense. Like yesterday, uh, I was um, traveling to, to um, 
represent Ira at at a conference at MIT, and I so I took the subway to a stop that I was familiar with, but I didn't know exactly how to get to the conference.、Uh, and there was all kinds of construction. So this is just an example. Like there were construction fences and orange cones, and you know, so to have kind of a real time update,、uh, you know, available to the app. Uh, might help you avoid rather than encounter, and then avoid if that makes sense. So, you know, rather, I mean, the way that it stands, I mean, you you basically have、uh, someone providing sighted guidance, but you basically get to the, <laughs> you know, the obstruction or the impediment、uh, before realizing it's there, and then you go around it. But you know, if, if, if there's a way to use technology to proactively identify those sorts of scenarios, and this could apply to you know. Uh, you know situations where there's an emergency, like a, an ambulance or a police activity or anything like that, and, and so proactively identify these things and avoid them rather than encounter and then avoid、uh, would be something I'd be excited to try and incorporate into the solution as well. Yeah, I had、uh, signed up for the early,、uh, I guess, adapter program. Unfortunately, it was out of my price range, but I am, I am still pretty hopeful that、uh, you know the prices might come down. You know, I know it's it's still in its early stages and. You know, but when you see Suman, ask him if he's still dining on my hundred bucks because、uh, I'm still waiting to receive that back. <laughs> but no, it's it's exciting. It is exciting.、Uh, I'm I'm excited to hear、uh, about somebody using it in real time. Yeah, no, it's it's an interesting solution, and I mean, you know, to their credit,、uh, you know, I know that they are are you know definitely aware of the price concerns. Certainly within the blindness community, there's been. You know, a number of, of people have expressed that same. You know, the affordability concern is very real, and they're aware of that. And, and to their credit, I mean, they are very open to that kind of feedback and responsive to that kind of feedback. So, Eric, let me ask you this: I mean, you work in the, in the, in the technology field. There's so many advances coming out.、Uh, being, you know, like Brian and myself, we have retinitis pigmentosa, and working in technology. What do you, what would you recommend for young people today? You know, kids that are growing up that you know, that either have RP or have you know LCA or, or other conditions where they are losing their sight or have lost their sight. I mean, what can we do to encourage them to get involved in science, technology, engineering, and math so that they can have a future and be part of this this technology revolution that's taking place you know, right around us? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it's exciting whenever I. Talk to a group of young people,、um, you know, because without fail, I mean, they they normally have ideas and thoughts that wouldn't necessarily have occurred to you before. You know, I mean, they just bring such fresh perspective. And so, you know, I heard someone, and I forget exactly who, so I, I'll apologize、uh, for not giving credit. But you know, someone had mentioned that you, you know you shouldn't. Be nervous. I mean, as someone in technology,、uh, you know, I'm 44 years old. So, in, in working in technology, and, and you know, I've heard it expressed that you know that makes some people a little nervous to be aging in technology because the millennials are, are coming along after you, right? And so, I've heard someone express that millennials are going to be the ones that actually take this over the goal line, like the accessibility,、uh, you know, which which I think is you know not far off. I mean. You know, I think there's different perceptions of disability. I think that, you know, with the younger, like, with younger people,、um, they don't look at disability so much as a, as a as something that needs to be separate, right? I mean, you know, for years there, disability was kind of, you know, considered、uh, almost like taboo to talk about, and and so now it's just something that. You know, people recognize.、Uh, I think there are much more inclusive attitudes. So when you have young people coming along,、uh, especially young people that have disabilities themselves, if they're inclined, you know, to take a technical path,、uh, then they can. There's just so much that they have to offer in terms of of their perspective. I mean, you know, whenever、um, you're working as part of a team, I mean, different perspectives matter, right? I mean, that's that's. One of the reasons that inclusion in the in the workplace is so important is because you get all different viewpoints, and you know. So for a young person who has a disability themselves, you know, when they're teaming with a with a broader group,、uh, 
invariably, you know, the the, the viewpoint that they bring to the discussion is going to be, you know, different or uh, not necessarily something that anyone else in that group has, has considered. So uh, it's a fresh perspective. If, if you're technically oriented or technologically oriented, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's so much that, that these young people uh, can stand to bring to the conversation and, uh, and you know, kind of help advance uh, the, the, the cause, so to speak. You've got something very exciting going on, though, at IBM, uh, the Accessible Oli. Am I pronouncing that correct? Oli or Oli? It's Oli, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> it's really a cool partnership. It's uh, and, and it was announced, actually, in uh, early January at CES, this year's CES conference, um, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And uh, it's a partnership between IBM and... And with the uh, CTA Foundation, who puts on CES, uh, but also with a company called Local Motors, uh, and they're based in Arizona. But uh, what they do, they're an auto manufacturer, and they produce 3D printed vehicles. Um, and it's really like I was able to, you know, a week and a half ago or a week, a little over a week ago, I was in D.C., uh, and was able to tour their facility there, and it's really something else. I mean, it's a heavy-duty... I have to stop you. Did you say 3D printed vehicles? <laughs> I did, which uh, is, is a little surprising to hear, but when you see these things, it's really amazing. I mean, they've had cars that, you know, that they've printed that are, um, I mean, very futuristic-looking, very cool-looking. Some of their cars have been used in, in movies like uh, Fast and Furious, you know, like that series, and um, you know, it's a really kind of a, a you know young and hip company, and and what they come out with is is really something else. Uh, the nice thing about three D printed vehicles uh, is that you know you can incorporate changes pretty pretty smoothly and quickly. Uh, you know, if if you were to request you know a, a design change from any of the you know the larger manufacturers. You know, you can make the request today and it could be years before you actually see it implemented. So, you know, that sort of manufacturing agility is is really one benefit of, of the 3D printed uh, model. And so, you know, the, the partnership that was announced, like one of the vehicles that Local Motors uh, has been producing is this. Uh, it's a 12 person shuttle van uh, called Ollie. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not quite a city bus you know 12 person van is you know so it's a little bigger than a van a little smaller than a, like a city bus but uh it seats 12 people it's an autonomous vehicle uh it's already got watson technology incorporated so when you know when the van pulls up and, and you get aboard there's there's a a really cool video circulating around it has james corden uh if you're familiar with james corden he does the uh, car karaoke videos <laughs> with, with celebrities but uh he gets aboard and he's greeted by Ollie, you know, saying, hi, James, you know, which is which is very cool. But uh, the challenge that we came away from CES with uh, as part of this partnership is is we're all committed to making this Ollie vehicle the most accessible autonomous vehicle there is. Uh, and I'm sure you both, you know, have, have heard a lot of the same chatter that I've heard uh, within, you know, the blindness community, within other disability communities. I mean, as a community. Uh, people with disabilities stand to benefit from, you know, the exciting driverless car technology to a great degree. Uh, but if you, you know, as someone with a disability, if you go out and get in this driverless car and you're not able to operate it because it's not accessible, then what's the point, right? So I'm excited and, you know, really ecstatic, to be honest, like to be part of a project and a collaborative effort like this where, you know, our sole intention is to make sure that you know this new emerging technology is is going to be done in a way that that can be accessed by everyone and so you know it's really been a, a gratifying uh, experience so far but you know we're still at the early stages our commitment was to go back to ces next year uh and demonstrate you know two or three use cases uh that that really show how accessible this uh this new technology can be Ed, uh, I think accessible Ollie is the coolest thing I've heard on this show yet. Yeah, well, I think it, I think it sounds cool. But what really sounded cool was the 3D printed vehicle because uh, I'm assuming that that is 3D printed component parts that still have to be assembled, but still pretty awesome. Yeah, you got that right, Ed. It's uh, you know, again, their 3D printer that I was able to take a tour of is is uh, is quite a quite an operation there. So yeah, I mean. 
you know, the parts that come out are heavy and heavy duty. And yeah, it takes some assembly. And, you know, I was, I was really surprised. I didn't realize how far 3D printing had in fact come. But yeah, it's really, uh, it's really something else. You know, what I'm really excited about, Ed, is uh, hearing about this 3D technology means that uh, pretty soon I'm going to be able to have my own personal 3D Sandra Bullock. You'll still have to inflate it, though, Brian. (laughs) (laughs) One more thing about Accessible Ollie. I know there's an awful lot of testing and legal loopholes they've got to go through. Do they have any kind of projection when they may think these things might realistically hit the road? Or is it too early for that? Um, well, I, I think that um, one thing, an- another thing that's nice about Accessible Ollie is that Ollie, you know, as a 12 person shuttle van, uh, it, it kind of lends itself to, um, you know, being used in kind of a campus or, you know, maybe like an airport or, you know, really literally like a shuttle. I mean, the, the top speed on Ollie as it stands right now is 30 miles an hour. Uh, so, most of the time this thing is running at like 22 to 25 miles an hour that's a good speed to get around new york city in <laughs> <laughs> with a little stop and go right uh but i'll say this you know we ran a couple of workshops where we're inviting ideas from all different you know user groups and one of the workshops we did last week was in, in washington dc we we're at the uh, the hatchery that uh, AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, uh, they have this innovation center in Washington, D.C. And so we went in there and we met with a group of, I think, 40 or 50 seniors uh, that, you know, brought really unique perspectives. And at the very beginning of, of the group that I sat in on, you know, it was clear that this group you know, of, of people were very nervous about the possibilities of driverless cars, right? They couldn't imagine being in a, a car that had no driver. I mean, you know, most of them have been driving themselves for years and years. And so, you know, to suggest to them that you're in a car that has no driver on a highway doing 65 or 70 miles an hour made them very nervous. But as we described, you know, what we're trying to do with this Ollie vehicle uh, and that it's a 12 person shuttle van and that You know, in the early stages, at least, it would be mostly something that was used in controlled settings, such as a a college campus or, you know, uh, like a military base or or some sort of a controlled environment. Uh, And then it would run at 30 miles an hour. I mean, slowly their their attitudes clearly seem to change. And as you described, you know, the benefits, the fact that this thing has Watson already included in it so that, you know, we'd like to get it to a point where. You know, if if Ollie's pulling up and it sees that you know you're a person at the at the at the stop there that's uh, using a wheelchair, well, automatically because it recognizes that fact, as soon as it pulls up, it automatically deploys the wheelchair ramp, right? And so you know, as you're describing a lot of the innovative possibilities, uh, combined with the fact that it's a little less uh, intimidating because it's only going 30 miles an hour, you know, at at the max. Uh, you know, really these people in these workshops uh, became more excited and really were, were starting to <laughs> be enthusiastic about, uh, you know, the possibility. Of- you know, where this could be huge is actually my, my parents live in a semi-retirement community and my dad just like within the last six weeks had to stop driving. Now, this is a huge complex they live in and they've got, a you know, a, a big um, clubhouse where they have... Uh, restaurant and activities and everything so just going around internally in that complex where you know you're gonna only you're probably only gonna go 20 25 miles per hour that's something that could be huge for these people that no longer drive and they want to get to their clubhouse i had that exact thought brian i you know my in-laws used to live in the villages down in florida and you know exactly like you're describing it's like this expansive like acres and acres and acres of you know retirement community most of the people there get around by golf cart you know (laughs) but you know once you lose that ability to drive you know i mean something that you know you can summon like you're calling an elevator you know and that can identify your location you know autonomously come to get you and and take you to the specific place that you're trying to go uh, without a lot of unnecessary stops or starts, without, you know, any sort of, you know, unnecessary time used, uh, you know, is very exciting possibility. So. 
Yeah, what I would like to do is just emphasize to our listeners, too, that you've mentioned Watson several times. And Watson is a much more sophisticated art of artificial intelligence uh, engine than anything we're used to dealing with, you know, Alexa or Siri as personal assistants. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, many people may know Watson, uh, you know, as some years back, actually, Watson um, won on Jeopardy. Uh, it was, you know, a kind of a showcase of the Watson technology where they put Watson up against some of the winningest players of Jeopardy's history and, uh, and Watson uh, performed very well. So that was very exciting. But, you know, the thing that's more exciting is that, you know, that was six years ago. And so Watson has only continued to learn and, and acquire data and, and information and you know, I mean, the the amount of data that Watson is fed and consumes on a daily basis is some astronomical number. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. But, you know, the fact that, you know, you can ask Watson a question and it doesn't just look up the answer and recite it back to you. It actually learns. And, you know, the next time, you know, I, if I express a preference to Watson and, and, you know, then I encounter Watson again, uh, it has learned my preference. And, and so, you know, a lot of possibilities with that, you know, in terms of personalizing the experience for all users and, uh, and doing so in an accessible fashion. But now this successful Ollie has got to be very excited for Ed because in a few years when we're doing the show and we got to put Ed in the home, he could probably get around <laughs> by accessible Ollie. He can call up Ollie. <laughs> okay, Stanley. <laughs> Well, Eric, this is exciting. I mean, you're involved. You got your hands in uh, so many exciting things. Uh, uh, is there a way people could follow you? Do you Twitter, Facebook? What's the best way for people to follow? Kind of what you got going on? Yeah, I invite anyone to you know connect on Facebook. I'm you know just Eric Manser on Twitter. I'm at Eric Manser. Uh, pretty boring, uh, but yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, I'm open and you know love to hear ideas and thoughts and uh, you know forward thinking. Um, I will say that I ran uh, for the first time using the Iris solution. I actually ran. I, I had to do a long training run gearing up for the Boston Marathon, so I did a uh, a long run. But for the first three miles of my run this morning, I ran with Jessica from Ira, uh, helping provide some virtual virtual guidance, which was kind of a cool thing. So uh, we're, we're toying with uh, trying to have sighted guides uh, via Ira, which was kind of a neat thing to, to try to play with. So, Well, this this has been uh, quite a thrill, and uh, Eric, uh, it was uh, great having you on, and uh, we look forward to hearing uh, all the great things IBM's doing as well as Ira. And uh, if you're going to be at CSUN, seek uh, Eric out because uh, he'll be there uh, with Suman uh, discussing Ira. And like I said, it's I'm still hopeful that uh, Ira is going to be something uh, for me, unless they cure blindness before they get uh, you know the prices down for Ira. Okay, Eric, travel safe. Enjoy CSUN. And uh, thank you for uh, sharing your time with our listeners. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. You're listening to Brian and Ed on iAccess VO. Wow, that was just unbelievable. Eric Manser doing some phenomenal things. And uh, we've been having a run of some pretty amazing guests, Ed. i got to pat us on the back there. Well, i got to pat our guests on the back because here you have people who are out there, you know, dealing with dealing with blindness. Uh, you know, some of our guests have been, you know, born blind. Others like Eric, uh, you know, have RP like you and I do. And they, you know, they've gone on and uh, accepted it, dealt with it and continued their their careers and have, have built phenomenal careers for themselves. And what I like about it as well, they're out there, they're working hard and they're willing to share their stories with other people, too, just to uh, either inspire or to uh, convey some information that's going to help them along. So and that's what I love about doing the doing the podcast. Yeah, no, and I, lo I love the passion that our guests have for the work they do. You can tell how passionate Eric is uh, about the work he does at IBM. And I'll tell you what. IBM, uh, some of these companies, you know, you don't hear about them as much as maybe an Apple or even a, a Google Talkback, but they're doing some impressive things with accessibility. Oh, they, I, you know, I learned a lot from uh, just talking to Eric uh, recently, and you know, it's amazing. But like you, like you said early on in, in the interview with him, uh, it's part of the enterprise system, so it's mostly business to business uh, type development. So uh, the consumer level really doesn't hear a lot about it. But what they're developing is trickling down into the day to day uh, accessible products that we have going on. Yeah. And amazingly, you told me uh, after the interview that you think I'm one of the few people on the planet that's smarter than Watson. <laughs> that lose you there? 
Um, I'm just dumbfounded. So you're saying you don't agree with that fact? <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say anything. I noticed that. I almost thought we lost the connection, though. We I, we broke recording with that statement. Sometimes silence is golden. No, no, never. Silence is bad. Silence is bad because you know why silence is bad? If we had silence, blind people won't know that anybody's there. You know, uh, one interesting thing that uh, we're reading about is uh, ways that we could talk to people potentially pretty soon is through the Echo devices and potentially the Google Home yeah, you mentioned that uh, they're going to be getting, uh, I guess, VoIP uh, calling uh, feature added on to it as well, right? Voice over internet protocol. Yeah, and as I was reading about this, I th- I think in Europe and Australia they may already have it. It's you know obviously in this country country we got FCC hangups and stuff. They got to get the nine one one calling. Uh, uh, you know, I guess working according to protocols and everything. So there seems to be more hangups. But I think I read a few articles that said this feature may already be uh, working in Europe as well as Australia. Well, that's pretty awesome. I mean, that that's something that I don't see why it shouldn't happen and why it shouldn't work. I mean, it'd be great to just sit there on your couch and just activate uh, activate your Echo device and uh, use it like a speakerphone. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I think it'd make a great speakerphone. Um, the sound quality is phenomenal. Yeah, plus plus what what the uh, the Echo has uh, I believe what seven microphones in it, so it'll be it'll be great for uh, you know doing calls with the family and group settings, things like that. So, be great. Yeah, you know, and one another thing, you know, we're reading about uh, Jeff Bezos was saying that they they've just gotten started with the Echo and and what it's going to be able to do, which is exciting to hear. And and you know, one of the things I was reading about was uh, uh, I guess. Uh, photos and and memories and stuff and i thought this was something that'd be very interesting to the blind community because you know right now we've got apps like facebook and other apps that are you know telling you a little data that's in a photo but when it comes to the echo device you know what i was reading was it's going to be able to tell you stories from your life and you know it's going to be taking that from the metadata so an example was you could say ask you know your echo device tell me something about mom and I guess if you put your photos into their photo app, this is something that, you know, doesn't work just yet, but it's something in the pipeline that it's going to be able to tell you stories about, you know, your mom or whoever's in a photo. Yeah, well, it all comes down to what's tagged. I mean, you know, the photo has to somehow be tagged that it is your mom and not your Aunt Betty, <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, all that metadata, there is a lot of data that's inside photographs based on location, based on time and date and things like that. And, you know, you are able now through alt tags to put additional information in there. So, you know, it all gets down to, like, if you log a few things in there and you build a library of it, there's no reason that it can't, like, you know, collect that information put it together and you know just like they build these uh, these videos for you now on Facebook uh, and on Google they could do they could do something very similar by putting that data together and tell you a story about the photographs yeah no it's very something like I said from a from a blindness standpoint because obviously the echo is not going to be showing you the photos so uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see where they're headed with this and where they're going with this. I mean, this could be something that could be great for the blindness community, and I'm excited about it. You know, while I'm happy about this, Ed, i got to tell you, there's a few things that are pissing me off. Well, we, would, we wouldn't have a podcast if we didn't cover what's pissing off Brian. So uh, what is it this episode, Brian? Well, first off, it is um, Verizon Vios. You know, I, I spent a good good amount of time with them talking to their engineers and explaining that blind people can't see CAPTCHAs. And they updated their app again, and once again, they went back to having a CAPTCHA to log into your account with no audio-enabled CAPTCHA either. CAPTCHAs are a nightmare. I hate them. Um, even with you, when, I, when I use my low vision and I... You know, zoom in with zoom text and everything else. You know, with the with the high contrast, I just can't always make it out, and it drives me insane. I uh, then spent an hour and a half on the phone with them because they kept 
for some reason, and uh, I'm hearing that this is going to the Supreme Court uh, from an attorney friend of mine. For some reason, they want to charge you five bucks to pay your phone over the bill, and uh, that's actually going to be illegal, hopefully, pretty soon. And I got it waived, and then they got me transferred to the department where you make the payment. And, of course, the guy says, oh, no, we didn't waive that. And let's just say a bunch of four-letter expletives flew out of my mouth. It's amazing this guy didn't disconnect me. And I explained to him, you know, that you can't pay your bill through the app. Their website is not accessible with a screen reader. So, And I asked him point blank, and I said, how do you expect a blind person to pay their bill without having to pay a fee for $5? And you know what this guy says to me, Ed? <laughs> what? He said, you can write a check. And you know what I said to him? There's no way you're this stupid. <laughs> Please tell me you're not this stupid. Like I said, it's amazing this guy didn't hang up on me, but he was that stupid. And eventually I did get transferred back to the original department did get a great employee there so there is at least one great employee at Verizon but this is just ridiculous I've dealt with this time and time again and every time they update their apps which is what set me off is I spent a decent amount of time on the phone with the engineers at Verizon Vios and they get it and then to come out again it's just some companies they've moved into the category with ESPN they're close to being dead to me but I've got to just finally switch cable providers I think eventually you know, but uh, something else that's pissing me off. Yeah, you know, it, it, like we discussed earlier, things with Apple just—it seems they're just failing everywhere. You know, one of—I was so excited for the Apple TV app; that was a disaster. One of the other things that I was really excited for in iOS 10 was Universal Clipboard. Only problem is it doesn't work, or it works for certain people. And I spent a good amount of time on the phone with Apple, and we. Did all the tests, making sure my Bluetooth was logged in, signed out of all my iCloud account. And I'll tell you, signing out of your iCloud account everywhere is not fun because all of a sudden everything on my desktop disappeared. All my contact information disappeared. It did come back eventually, but it's 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 not fun, you know. And we spent a good amount of time doing this. And amazingly, she said she was going to kick it up to engineering. And I did, you know, when you hear that, you don't expect to ever hear back from Apple. A few days later, I did get a phone call back from Apple, and the woman confirmed this is not just a problem I'm having. It's a problem a lot of people are having. And it, it just, I don't know what's going on with Apple, but, uh, you know, it, it, things just are not working the way they used to work. And uh, it, it's been a very disappointing run with Apple. And you and I were talking about this. I'm looking more and more at Microsoft and uh, the PC side all of a sudden. Yeah, and look at the conversation we had last week with Jeff Bishop actually saying that for a lot of people in the blind community, if they start off now with the Android platform, it may not be the wrong thing for them to do. If you've got the money, you're just going to have to live in, in both uh, both uh, you know, ecosystems. ecosystems. Yeah, so yeah. You know, it's, it's just uh, gone are the days where you could just – I thought it would always be Apple for me, but uh, gone are those days because Apple's just disappointing. Well, you know what it is? It's, you know, it's like we discussed le- the last show, too. It's like, you know, we have to have a lot of tools in our toolbox. And there's a lot out there. And if we're proficient in a handful or, or more of different things, there are very few tasks that as blind, visually impaired people that we cannot tackle. So, you know, the ability to do it is there. It's unfortunate that you know, there's just no single one solution. Yeah. No, there's not. And, uh, you know, uh, it's february we're getting close to march which means uh, spring training is in full gear and we're very excited as we mentioned on our last show we're launching the first iaccess vo fantasy baseball league and you could uh, tweet us in or email us in uh actually email us in if you want to get into the league at iaccessvo at gmail.com if you want to experience fantasy baseball it's through yahoo completely free and uh, ed we also finally got set up the uh I access VO basketball March Madness tournament. I don't think you've joined yet. I got your invite. I have to take care of that. I've been, like I said, I've been down for a few days here, being you know feeling a little ill, but uh, I'm I'm getting back on my feet, so we'll take care of that. I'm actually off tomorrow for uh, President's Day on Monday, so I'll uh, we'll take care of that. I think and get that done. Yeah, in the March Madness League, you don't necessarily need to email us in. Uh, I believe the name if you if you have the Yahoo Fantasy app. Uh, you could click to join uh, the March Madness tournament. The name of the league is iAccessVO, and I believe the password is blind. 
I was just trying to think of uh, if you, of what it would just be a universal password and everything. Is there is there a two step verification on that, Brian? No, but they Yahoo may ask you for your cell phone number. If you just keep flicking to the right, I think there is a skip this step and everything. And uh, yeah, no, it's it's just. Yahoo stop asking people for their phone numbers and you know it's almost like like Yahoo just wants to collect everybody's phone number just to have it. Yeah, well, I'm sure that's part of that's part of marketing, but uh, yeah, I think it was pretty cool because just before just before we started the show, I started recording this show. I think we got a tweet in that somebody somebody said they were interested in the uh, the fantasy baseball. So I think you're up there. I think we probably have. Uh, you, you're looking to get twelve. What are we up about about seven right now? Ah, uh, we're about seven. Yeah, so we got a few spots left and everything. We're not drafting till late March and. I will be sending out a kind of uh, new to fantasy baseball. Here's a few helpers to, you know, because some of, some people that are in the league have never played before. Uh, John Panaris is in the league from Mac for the Blind. Jeff Bishop has gotten into the league, so uh, we've got a good bunch and everything. I think Jeff is new to fantasy baseball. I know John has played it before, and uh, we've got some other first timers and everything. So well, you did you did a good job because I think we had we had a we had a. A fair number of people who did the fantasy football who had never done fantasy football before, and I think you, you did a really decent job of keeping people informed and communicating with them and walking them through the different steps to get everything set up. So uh, you know, it's a, great, it's a great opportunity to do that. It's nice to have somebody like you who is a diehard fantasy player. So uh, if you want you want to get uh, learn how to play all this and deal with it, uh, Brian is your man. And I got to, you know, we, we've been giving Yahoo a large, a hard time about asking for the phone number. I do have to give them a compliment. They had a kind of, they didn't really break accessibility, but they had messed up something uh, in the fantasy app. Uh, and they, they just fixed it uh, for voiceover users. Did a great job. And they actually mentioned uh, voiceover improvements in the uh, notes uh, for the app update, which I always like to see when they mentioned that. So that was pretty cool. That is good. I mean, I know you got a, you have a good working relationship with them. I'm hoping that one of these days we'll be able to get them on our on one of our episodes so that we can really help promote uh, what they're doing because they've been doing a great job. Well, there's talk, you know, maybe uh, right before baseball season that they may come on, but uh, we're, we're just waiting for that approval. I know they will be at CSUN again, uh, you know, so if you're out at CSUN, check out that, uh, that Yahoo. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's just Yahoo Fantasy. I think it's just – the whole entire Yahoo app suite and everything and how they're doing with accessibility, which they've had a good run there. They have had a good run. Good. Very good. So, uh, hey, you know what, my friend? You're getting this ready is to go episode lay down. Number, this is episode number 36. And, yes, I am about to go lay down because uh, this has been a lot today with the interview and then doing the show. And I'm a little tired getting back on my feet. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. We will let you run because we are out. You have been listening to iAccess VO. If you'd like to contact us with ideas and suggestions for future podcasts, please email us at iAccessVO at gmail.com or visit our website at www.accessquest.org. 